Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Sutterbeek program, welcome to uh, this evening. My name is Joost van Vught. I'm on the staff of the Sutterbeek program, and it's my honor to chair this evening with our special guest, Dr. Norman Finkelstein. Very special word of welcome to you, Dr. Finkelstein. And we are very glad that you could find the time to visit Nijmegen during a very busy European lecture tour. Ladies and gentlemen, Norman Finkelstein is an American political scientist who in the course of his academic career has specialized in the contemporary perception of the Holocaust and in the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict. From the beginning, his publications and lectures have caused controversy because he is very outspoken, a sharp critic and debater, and because he has some controversial ideas on subjects which in the public mind are riddled with emotions. It has become very difficult to discuss, discuss issues like the Holocaust and Israel and the Palestinians without ending up in a shouting match. We will try to avoid that this evening, but it's obvious that emotions play an important role in the whole subject and that the role of these emotions should not be neglected when searching for a solution. Norman Finkelstein's academic career has suffered considerably from the emotions that arose around his publications, but his credentials as an academic are impressive. He wrote a whole series of important books which were translated into many languages. Just to name a few, The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering, Beyond Chutzpa, on the misuse of anti-Semitism and the abuse of history, and recently, Knowing Too Much, Why the American Jewish Romance with Israel is Coming to an End. Norman Finkelstein is of Jewish descent. Much of his family died in the Holocaust, and his parents were <coughs> Holocaust survivors from Poland. But he has always felt that his background should not prevent him of being critical. Critical of the way the historical event of the Holocaust is used today as an ideological weapon. And critical of the way the State of Israel tries to maintain itself against the Palestinians and against the Arab world as a whole. In 2008, he was denied access to Israel for the next 10 years. Somebody up there definitely does not like him. Norman Finkelstein's lecture this evening will tackle one of the most intractable political problems of the post-war world, the conflict in the Middle East. Several wars, terrorism and counter-terrorism, and countless diplomatic offensives, offensives have not succeeded in bringing the solution an inch closer. Yet Norman Finkelstein has chosen for his lecture an ambitious title, How to Solve the Israel-Palestinian Conflict, and we are looking forward to his insights. Dr. Finkelstein will talk for about an hour. After that, I will ask him some questions on his lecture, but we organize this evening not for us, but for you, the audience, and I do hope that you will ask Dr. Finkelstein a lot of questions and that you will deliver your comments on his ideas freely and politely. <laughs> Dr. Finkelstein, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me this evening. <laughs> it happens that my views on the Israel-Palestine conflict, as you'll discover presently, they aren't very controversial, contrary to what might seem to be the case, but I do have very controversial opinions on tweeting and text messaging during a lecture. <laughs> so I have to warn you, I came equipped with my phaser. It's not on stun, it's on kill. <laughs> if I see people text messaging or tweeting. 
never understood why one would want to tweet, because if you're tweeting, you must be a bird brain, which at least in American English is an insult. <laughs> you use that in Dutch? A bird brain? Maybe Dutch birds are smart. <laughs> Uh, the topic that I'm speaking about this evening happens to be the title of a forthcoming book, which I am co-authoring with a Palestinian of Dutch descent, who by good fortune happened to be able to make it here this evening. So I would like to introduce Moeen Rabani, who in my opinion, and I think the opinion of many people, is the world's authoritative political analyst of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Formerly, he sat on the Palestine desk at the International Crisis Group. And we're, we've been working for some time now on the book, which, as was said, has an ambitious goal, namely to put forth a feasible, and just resolution of the conflict. And that seems to be on two counts, on two counts to be an unpopular idea now. This morning I read in the news, or I was told actually over dinner, that the Secretary General of the United Nations has proclaimed that the conflict is unsolvable obviously trying to sabotage our royalties, <laughs> of getting close to being unsolvable. And if there could be yet worse news, the Haaretz website announced that the Palestinian head of state, Mr. Abbas, has adopted the Alan Dershowitz peace plan which is obviously cause for concern. Uh, nonetheless, and notwithstanding, uh, I think that a reasonable uh, examination of the facts gives grounds for hope, not certainty, I won't even say probability, but certainly possibility that the conflict can find its resolution and actually can find its resolution in the near, uh, relatively near future. To use an old kind of language, I would say that all the objective factors are now in place to achieve a resolution, the main obstacle now is the subjective factors, the problem of a movement gaining momentum among the Palestinians and a leadership which is able to capitalize on that movement. If those two factors come into play, and it's anyone's guess, if and when they will, if those two factors come into play, then it's my opinion, and perhaps slightly less optimistically, the opinion of Muin, that a resolution may actually be within reach. Now I know that sounds like a very Pollyannish reading of the current record, so the burden of, my, burden of my remarks this evening is to try to demonstrate what I have just said. There have obviously been, it's no uh, surprise to anyone in this room, there have obviously been major regional changes and less well-known but probably more significant there have been major changes in public opinion, such that a resolution might be possible. The most obvious changes 
are what occurred during and still continue to unfold in what's come to be called the Arab Spring, and also what immediately preceded the Arab Spring. Israel's main ally historically in the Muslim world has been Turkey. But under the new leadership of Prime Minister Erdogan, Turkey has charted a more independent foreign policy and is obviously vying for some sort of regional leadership. And it understands that one way to achieve a regional prominence is by championing the cause of Palestine. Now, obviously, there's a large element of political pragmatism, or you might say opportunism, in the Turkish stand. And there's also a large element, I think, of authentic ideological commitment to the cause of Palestine. It's also true to say that Turkey's support has been more in words than in action. There's more bluster than there is bite. But it's also true that Turkey has drawn its own red lines. So for example, after the Israeli assault on the Mahdi Marmara Freedom Flotilla, when Israel killed eight Turkish citizens, Turkey set its red lines, which to date it has stood by, that there can't be a restoration of normal relations with Israel until Israel apologizes for the killings, pays compensation, and they're probably less committed to the third condition, namely lifting the immoral and illegal blockade of Gaza. Israel's main ally since 1979 in the Arab world has, of course, been Egypt. And Egypt, too, can no longer be counted on as a reliable ally for Israel as Israel pursues its wars of aggression regionally and its repression of the people of Palestine. Again, one should not exaggerate the kinds of support one might expect from the new Egypt. It's certainly not going to, and probably shouldn't, liberate Palestine. But on the other hand, what one can say with certainty I think you can say with certainty, is that Israel cannot carry on the way it has in the past. So for example, in 2008-2009, Israel invaded Gaza, what Amnesty International called the 22 days of death and destruction, and the ensuing massacre in Gaza simply could not have happened were it not for the collaboration of Egypt under Mr. Mubarak, if for no other reason than Egypt sealed its border and sealed the Palestinians in Gaza to their fate. Now, it was only shortly after what Israel called Operation Cast Lead it was only shortly after Operation Cast Lead that Israel began talking about what it called Operation Cast Lead II. What we can say, I think, with a certain amount of sureness, they can't do that again. There will not be an Operation Cast Lead II. Yes, Israel will periodically invade Gaza, commit its routine murder and mayhem, <coughs> and then retreat. But a massacre on the scale, on the dimensions of what happened during those 22 days, I think it's fair to say 
that between Turkey and Egypt, the new constellation of forces in that part of the world, Israel simply couldn't carry on or execute a massacre of those dimensions any longer. As I said, one shouldn't exaggerate the changes, but on the other hand, one shouldn't underplay them. There are significant changes that have occurred that have put real limits on Israel's ability to carry on as it has in the past. Internationally, there has been a very significant shift in public opinion. Now, young people are simply not in a position to appreciate, by virtue of their age, just how dramatically public opinion in Europe and internationally, how dramatically its opinion of Israel has changed. To take one, I think, indicative example, every year the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, every year they do a survey and they ask a very simple question. They list about 34 or 36 countries, and they ask a, a, a random sampling of people, do you think this country has had a positive or a negative impact on world opinion? And every year for the past 10 years, the same countries are always, the same four countries, are always clustered at the bottom of the list as the four countries which have had an overwhelmingly negative impact on the world. Three of those four countries, I suspect most of you could guess from the top of your head, Iran, always at the bottom. Iraq, excuse me, Iran, always at the bottom. Pakistan, always at the bottom, North Korea, I need not go further, <laughs> and the fourth is always Israel. In the public mind internationally, Israel is always, every year, grouped with Iran, Pakistan, and North Korea. Now that's a doubly remarkable phenomenon. First of all, that it's grouped with them, but secondly, because of the other three countries, I think we can all agree that their press coverage and media coverage is overwhelmingly negative. So if I were to ask you in the room, has anyone at any point in his or her life ever read one article favorable to North Korea, I think I can be certain of the answer. Except, of course, when Kim Jong-il kicked the bucket. There was <laughs> some positive notice in the papers. But I very much doubt there is anyone in this room who hasn't read and seen a lot of positive coverage about Israel. Human interest stories, sympathetic stories to its sufferings, and so forth. But in the public mind, notwithstanding the news coverage, the media coverage, the public mind sees something very different. It sees in Israel, which from the vantage point of international affairs, is no better and no worse than Iran North Korea and Pakistan. That's a very remarkable shift in public opinion. It means that Israel's propaganda edifice has finally more or less collapsed. And a lot of the truth, not all of it, but a lot of the truth is now out there and a lot of the truth is now known by a broad public opinion. 
the shifts in public opinion, not as dramatic, but still significant, have also occurred in the United States. Public opinion now, for example, in that BBC poll I mentioned, remarkably in the United States, the poll showed that half of Americans said Israel has a positive impact on world affairs, but fully half said negative. Very surprising development, especially when you consider the media coverage of Israel in the United States. Only about half of Americans say the U.S. should support Israel, and less than half say that Israel attacks Iran, the U.S. should support it. This change in public opinion in the U.S. has also made itself felt among American Jews. American Jewry is now the period of its blind support for Israel is now coming to an end. And the reason is pretty obvious, it's pretty straightforward. American Jews are overwhelmingly liberal. And in the 2008 the historic election in the United States, 80% of American Jews voted for Barack Obama. Apart from African Americans, it was the highest percentage of any ethnic or religious group voting for Mr. Obama. Among white people in general, the support for Obama was about 46%. Among Latinos, it was only about 63%. But Jews, Jews are liberal. It was 80%. When you consider that American Jews are now by far the wealthiest ethnic group, religious ethnic group in the United States, and most people in elections vote by virtue of their pocketbook, and the Republican Party is reputedly the party of the rich, then Jews should be overwhelmingly voting Republican. But they do not. They do not vote their class interests. They are liberal. They vote democratic. In fact, Latinos are among the poorest ethnic groups in the United States, but they vote Republican in much higher percentages than American Jews. Being liberal in the United States means probably pretty much the same thing as here. On an international level, it means supporting human rights, the rule of law, international institutions like the UN, the use of diplomacy rather than force to resolve conflicts. That's what it means to be liberal. And now things have come to a pass where it's no longer tenable for American Jews to claim to be both liberal and supporters of Israel. It's come to that situation for a very simple reason. American Jews just know too much. The American Jewish population is highly educated. Something like 98% of American Jews get a college education and well past that in terms of professional degrees. If you go to a university, you're exposed to many more ideas than if you watch CNN and Fox News. And they simply know too much to be able, in good conscience, or without looking hypocritical, to support the way Israel carries on. And that's especially true of Jewish young people. The typical American Jewish college student, young, liberal, idealistic. That's your typical Jewish college student. So your young Jewish 
liberal, idealistic. It's 2006. Israel invades Lebanon, the 34-day invasion. We're now in the last 72 hours of the Israeli assault. The war is over. A UN resolution has been passed. Condoleezza Rice, for three weeks, blocked the passage of that resolution. Finally, for reasons which time don't allow, she ceases blocking it. The resolution is passed. The war is over. After the resolution is passed, we're waiting for its implementation on the ground. And you, Israel uses the occasion of those last 72 hours, when the war is already over, to drop 4 million, 4 million cluster bomblets on South Lebanon, saturating, as if it were a science fiction movie, saturating entire villages with those cluster bomblets. For those of you who are interested, even Rights Watch put out a good report entitled Flooding South Lebanon, depicting what Israel did. So you're young, Jewish, idealistic, you're on a college campus, you don't want to have to defend that. 2008, 2009, Israel invades Gaza. It drops on two hospitals, Al-Quds Hospital and Al-Wafa Hospital. It drops the white phosphorus, a substance that reaches 800 degrees Celsius, 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It drops the white phosphorus in two hospitals in Gaza as well as a marketplace, a school, and a humanitarian warehouse. Actually, uh, Human Rights Watch did a good report on that also, entitled Reign of Fire. You're young, you're Jewish, you're idealistic, you're liberal. You don't want to have to defend that in public. Now, of course, there are people who will defend that. If you're a Sarah Palin's son, <laughs> Paul Ryan's daughter, uh, Rush Limbaugh's whatever, yeah, you'll defend it. Some people will even defend breaking the kneecaps of nuns. Actually, that's true. If you just remember, and for those of you who remember the wars in Central America, when four nuns were raped, and the uh, UN representative at the time, Jean Kirkpatrick, she said, well, they were probably running a roadblock. No further comment. But, as you can see from Jean Kirkpatrick's name, she's not Jewish. It's not a Jewish thing. Jews just don't, I'm not saying they don't do those things, but it's just not a Jewish thing to defend things like that in public, Jews are liberal. Well, the long and the short of it is, for the first time in a very long time, actually the first time ever, there's actually a broad public out there that's ready to listen. The broad public, the first thing, this is not new, the first thing is the broad public knows there's a problem in that part of the world, the Israel-Palestine conflict. That's not new. But what is new is that now there's a broad public that acknowledges, that knows, that Israel bears a significant burden of responsibility, culpability, for that problem in that part of the world. For those of you who are roughly of my age cohort, until fairly recently, the image Israel projected was 
that it was the wholly innocent party in the conflict, and most people accepted it. But that has changed. I am not saying that the broad public thinks Israel is wholly responsible. No, that's not true. And in fact, I still think Israel has been able to present an image of itself much more favorable than the facts would warrant. But, in my opinion, the broad public now knows enough that we have a chance to reach that public, to mobilize that public, to get the public to act. But there is a condition for achieving success, and the condition is we have to present a unified message. Otherwise, you lose the public. If gentleman A says, well, the solution is two states. But gentleman B says, no, the solution is one democratic secular state. But gentleman C says, no, the solution is a binational state. And the young woman, D, says, no, the solution is an Islamic state. Well, then the public thinks, rightfully, if they don't know what they want, then this, po this problem clearly cannot be resolved. So we have to present a unified message such that you can get a broad public to rally behind it. And that brings us to the second question, namely, what should that message be? And the real challenge before laying out what the message should be, the real challenge is figuring out on what basis, on what foundation, do you create a goal? How do you figure out in politics what your goal should be? In the Israel-Palestine conflict, there is a tendency, I think, to constantly personalize the issue of goal. So the moment you engage in the discussion about Israel-Palestine, the question almost immediately arises, do you support one state or two states? As if your opinion were the relevant criterion for setting a goal. And I think that that is off the mark. I recently, or not so recently, but several years back, I decided to read a little bit about how Gandhi formulated the goals of the Indian independence movement, since after all, he too was trying to end an occupation, trying to do it nonviolently, and most critically, Gandhi was trying to do it by building a mass movement. So what was his criterion for trying to, to, for setting a goal? And it really was a kind of revelation for me when I began to read through his writings, which are quite formidable. They run to 100 volumes, 500 pages per volume. He had a lot to say on many subjects, most of which he freely admitted he didn't have a clue what he was talking about, <laughs> but that never prevented Gandhi from venturing an opinion. But obviously, in the realm of politics, he had a rich life experience that was distilled through a very shrewd mind, a shrewd political mind, so shrewd that it nearly drove the British mad. Uh, 
And Gandhi's opinion was politics is not about trying to change public opinion. Politics is not about trying to change public opinion. Politics is about trying to get people to act on what they already know is wrong, which is something very different. Everybody in this room has had the experience of going through the day and waxing indignant over all the injustices and unfairnesses he or she sees around themselves. That's unfair. That's unjust. That shouldn't be. That's just not right. But most of us, after venting our indignation, we don't do much about it. And for Gandhi, the problem was not that the masses, the proverbial masses, it's not that they were ignorant and they needed enlightenment. No. That was sort of the way Marxists used to conceive their task. They know the truth. Their truth is a science. It's as precise and objective as particle physics. The masses suffer from false consciousness and other forms of ignorance. And the job of the Marxists was to go among the masses and bring enlightenment, bring light where there was hitherto darkness. Gandhi said, that's not what politics is about. Most people know there's a lot wrong in their society. They're perfectly aware of it. The problem is, how do you get them to act on their awareness of the wrong? And that, for Gandhi, was the purpose of nonviolent civil disobedience. You get arrested, using Gandhi's language now, you get your skull broken, you get yourself, which for Gandhi was the most important, if you read the real Gandhi and not the Hollywood version of him, for Gandhi the most important thing was to get yourself killed. Now that's a fact. If you read Gandhi's writings, he had a veritable death cult. You were supposed to get yourself killed. Obviously not for the sake of being killed, but for the poor purpose of arousing the public conscience. Or as Gandhi said, to quicken the dead conscience of public opinion into life. And in his view, if the public sees people suffering, if he's, the public sees people getting killed, that that, from their sense of pity, will arouse them into action. But there's one critical qualification. And the critical qualification is no matter how just your tactics, no matter how nonviolent they are, no matter how great is the magnitude of your personal sacrifice, the public will never act if it doesn't agree with your goals. It's not enough that they agree with your means, your nonviolent means, your willingness for self-sacrifice up to and including the giving of your life, they have to agree with your goals. So some of you have a perplexed look on your face. So as a practical example, if I were to ask, is there anyone in this room who would be willing to volunteer the information in public that he or she is a supporter of a woman's right to abortion. So would anyone like to raise his or her hand? Okay. So if I were to ask this gentleman sitting in the first row wearing a t-shirt that looks like some version of sadist, but I'm not sure. 
<laughs> so it's a long story. I hope it didn't take a detour through a jail cell. Um, in any case, if this whole room of people were filled with people, were filled with those opposed to a woman's right to abortion, and they were so committed to that conviction that they said they were going to go on a fast unto the death in order to stop the commission of abortions. Would that move you to support the end of abortions? No. no. Most people who believe in the right to abortion, they would think, I hope they do go on a fast to the death. I hope they all drop dead. <laughs> Unless the public agrees with your goal, unless the public agrees with your goal, there's no possibility that the tactics Mr. Gandhi championed have any possibility of reaching a broad public. With that as the framework, now we turn to the specific question, namely, what is a broad goal that is likely to reach a public and mobilize them, get them to act. Bear in mind the criterion. We are not asking what I support or what any individual or group of individuals in this room <coughs> might happen to support as a goal. We're asking a very different question, namely, what goal is likely to resonate to reach a broad public and, of course, achieve the maximum possible in terms of justice? And here it seems to me the answer is very straightforward. In the world in which we live today, in the current world, the most progressive language, the most enlightened language, what you might call the political horizon of enlightened opinion, the most progressive enlightened language is the language of international law and human rights. Now, for many of you in this room, present company included, that language and its precepts leave a lot to be desired. It is very limited from those who have a more idealistic vision of what a just world should look like. Nonetheless, I do think it represents the maximum of what can be achieved and still keep the broad public, which recognizes the legitimacy of international law and recognizes the legitimacy of human rights and recognizes the authority of the expressors of that law and human rights. For example, the human rights organizations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, to which I'll return presently. So, rather than put forth what I or my co-author Muin might happen to believe is the right formula for resolving the conflict, I want to stick to what seems to me the right political way of approaching the problem, which is to ask, what does international law and human rights law have to say about the Israel-Palestine conflict? Because I think those references have a very good chance of resonating with that broad public. 
And here, remarkably enough, contrary to everything you read on the topic, the Israel-Palestine conflict is probably the least complicated, the least complex. It is almost certainly the simplest conflict in the world today. Now, I notice that some people are laughing, smiling, snickering, not the chocolate bar. Other meaning of snickering. <laughs> and so, the burden henceforth is for me to prove that proposition, as it were, scientifically, and then at the end, to see whether I have convinced you, as I am confident I can do. So let's begin with the most representative political body in the world. So if I were to ask you what is the most representative political body in the world, you would say, yes, the UN General Assembly. And as it happens, every year, the UN General Assembly votes on a resolution entitled Peaceful Settlement of the Palestine Question. And every year they put forth the same terms for resolving the conflict. Two states on the June 1967 border, a full Israeli withdrawal from the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, and East Jerusalem, and a just resolution of the Palestinian refugee question. Those are the terms. By now, it's a very long resolution. There's a lot of paper that accumulates in the United Nations. Many poor trees have perished <laughs> at the altar of the UN. But that's the essence of the settlement they put forth. And every year, the vote is the same. The whole world on one side, Israel, the United States, and a handful of South Sea Islands on the other. So to sample the record, in 1997, the vote was 155 to 2. The whole world on one side, Israel and the United States on the other. 2004, the vote 161 to 7. The whole world on one side, Israel, the United States, Australia, Grenada, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau on the other side. 2011, this past year, the vote 167 to 7. The whole world on one side, Israel, the US, Australia, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau on the other side. As it happens, the United States owns more the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau. <laughs> they are American protectorates. Their combined populations can fit in the empty seats in this room this evening. <laughs> and with all due respect to small countries and not wanting to disparage them, a couple of these countries, due to global warming, won't be with us much longer. <laughs> I think it's very politically incorrect to laugh at that fact. <laughs> the people of Kabbalah would expect more of you. So, as we proceed, keep asking yourself the same question. Is this a controversial vote? Or is it so overwhelmingly imbalanced in one direction that it comes almost, it verges on unanimity? Well, 
What about those Arabs? Where do they stand? And the Arabs have their own regional representative organization, the Arab League. The Arab League put forth what it calls the Arab Peace Initiative. What is it? Exactly the same as the UN Initiative. Two states on the June 67 border, just resolution of the refugee question, and also they say if Israel agrees to these terms, we will normalize relations with Israel, allowing for trade, tourism, and so forth. What's the controversial vote in the Arab League, which renews its initiative every several years? The vote was 22 to 0. Well, what about those terroristic Islamic states? And indeed, there is an organization embracing all of the terrorist Islamic states in the world today. It's called the Organization of the Islamic Conference. It contains 57 members. All 57 members, including the Islamic Republic of Iran, endorsed the Arab Peace Initiative, which was the echo of the UN General Assembly resolution. In fact, in the real world, for those who wish occasionally to make contact with it, in the real world, since 2003, every year in the United Nations, Iran votes with that majority in favor of the two-state settlement. Check for yourself, peaceful settlement of the Palestine question. Iran is not an obstacle to resolving the conflict. OK, some of you might think United Nations, well, they're obviously all anti-Semites. That's transparent, <laughs> except for Palau, Nauru, Micronesia, and Martin <laughs> seem to enjoy a special immunity. So if I were to ask a more difficult question, but not difficult for such a sophisticated university audience with a smattering of adults. I didn't want to say senior citizens. <laughs> I'm not sure what the middle ground is. Adults, senior citizens, mature people. A, smatter, a smattering of mature people. Mature adults. But that's what they use with pornography. <laughs> that's not the United but uh, as your generation likes to say. Um, what is the most respected legal body in the world? Anyone want to venture? Yes. Yes, the International Court of Justice, which happens to have its home where? In the Hague. <laughs> I'm very proud of my Dutch. <laughs> and as it happens, in 2004, the International Court of Justice rendered an advisory opinion on one aspect of the Israel-Palestine conflict. And in the course of rendering its opinion as a preliminary step, the ICJ had to run through what is the current law on a sequence of questions bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict. And by coincidence, the series of questions they had to answer as the preliminary to rendering their advisory opinion, three of those four questions they answered are what are called the permanent status issues bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Those issues which we're told are so complicated, so complex, that they have to be left to the final stages of negotiations, because if you start with them, we're told, 
the negotiations will immediately break down because they're so complicated. So is there anyone here who in his, his or her almighty wisdom supplemented by a little bit of reading? I don't mean text messages. I don't mean tweets. I mean something of broader scope, maybe an article. I won't even venture on the terrain of book. <laughs> Judging by my book sales, that is a thing of the past. <laughs> because it can't be the quality of my books. So, is there anyone here who would want to venture, what are the permanent status issues bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict? Anyone want to try to name one of the four? Settlements is one. Refugees is two. Jerusalem is three. Very good. And borders. Borders, Jerusalem, settlements, and refugees. Those are what are called the final status or permanent status issues. And as it happens, the International Court of Justice, it rendered opinion an opinion on three of those four questions. There are 15 judges sitting on the court, including one from your own country. Judge, who knows the judge from your own country on the court? Koyman. Koyman. And this is what they said. Number one, they said, under international law, it's illegal to acquire territory by force. Israel acquired the whole of the West Bank in Gaza in the course of the June 1967 war, namely by force. Therefore, Israel has no title to any of the West Bank, any of Gaza. The court ruled the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza. They are occupied Palestinian territories. Full stop. Number two. The court said Israel acquired East Jerusalem in the course of the same war that it acquired the West Bank and Gaza. East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. Full stop. No ambiguity, no caveat, no qualification. Repeatedly, in the court opinion, it refers to the West Bank, comma, including East Jerusalem, comma, and Gaza as occupied Palestinian territory. Number three, the court ruled that under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's illegal for an occupying power to transfer its population to occupied territory. Therefore, all the settlements all the settlements are illegal under international law. So, what do we get from that? Number one, the vote. Again, you judge for yourself whether it was a controversial vote. There are 15 judges sitting on the court, including Koyman and two Jewish judges, well, he's since retired, Bergenfeld, but two Jewish judges, Rosalind Higgins from the UK, she married an Irishman, and Bergenfeld from the US. Not one, not one of the 15 judges sitting on the court dissented, expressed any disagreement with those opinions. The vote was on the issue they were looking at, the vote was 14 to 1. The American judge issued what he called not a dissent, but a declaration. However, even the American judge, even the American judge was careful to qualify by saying, number one, there is much in the advisory opinion of the 14 others with which I agree. And number two, he said, there can't be any question but that all the settlements 
are illegal under international law. No controversy whatsoever. That leaves the refugee question. The court, because it was confining itself to a specific issue, namely the wall that Israel has been building in the West Bank, it wasn't relevant, it wasn't pertinent to register a comment or an opinion on the refugee question. However, the leading human rights organizations in the world have registered opinions. So if I were to ask someone to name internationally the most respected human rights organization, you would say Amnesty International. And right behind Amnesty, you would say Human Rights Watch. So as it happens, both organizations, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, have issued position papers on the refugee question. Both Amnesty and Human Rights Watch say almost the exact same thing. Human Rights Watch, we urge Israel to recognize the right to return for those Palestinians and their descendants who fled from territory that is now within the state of Israel and who have maintained appropriate links with that territory. Amnesty, we call for Palestinians who fled or were expelled from Israel, the West Bank, or Gaza, along with those of their descendants who have maintained genuine links with the area, to be able to exercise their right to return. Well, what do we conclude from that survey of, by virtue of the audience's prompting, not my own, are the most represented, representative and respected political and human rights organizations in the world. The conclusions, it seems to me, are pretty straightforward. Number one, there's simply no significant uh, disagreement. There is no significant disagreement on the terms for resolving the conflict. If you use the accepted, respected, and authoritative criteria of international law and human rights law, if that's your framework, which as I've said I think is the only framework available to resolve the conflict, there is no controversy, no dispute about what it takes, what it requires, what needs to be done to resolve the conflict. The second obvious conclusion is that on all of the permanent status issues, borders, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees, Israel's official position has been wholly rejected, repudiated by the international community. Israel says the West Bank and Gaza are disputed territories. Not so, says the International Court of Justice. They are occupied Palestinian territories, full stop. Israel says East Jerusalem is part of its eternal and undivided capital. Not so, says all 15 members of the International Court of Justice. East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. Israel and most of the media, I can't speak now for Netherlands, I could speak for North America. Israel and most of the media allege that the settlements that Israel has built are controversial. In fact, you can barely see a sentence referring to the settlements, which is not qualified by the controversial settlements Israel has built. In fact, there is precisely and exactly one can measure it to the last decimal point. There is precisely and exactly zero controversy 
over the status of those settlements. One and all, they are all illegal under international law. And number four on the refugee question, the most respected and authoritative human rights organizations in the world, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have weighed in saying the Palestinians, yes, they do have a right of return. And it's precisely because Israel is fully aware of where international law leads that Israel is, to quote Foreign Minister, former Foreign Minister Sidney Livni, she said at one point in the negotiations with the Palestinians, she said, I am a lawyer, but I am against law, international law in particular. And in fact, coming from her, it was a very consistent statement because she, is, she was the foreign minister. She has to represent the position of her state. And as a lawyer, she's fully aware that international law is at loggerheads, conflicts, is in, is in contradiction with the official positions of her state that she's representing. So she has to be against international law. I won't now go through the positions of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, except to say on the question of the Palestinian Authority, there is now available a very extensive documentary record of basically the transcripts of the negotiations that unfolded between 1999 and 2009. They have come to be called the Palestine Papers. They were leaked to Al Jazeera. And they're quite a substantial record, even though it's not a full record, it runs to something like 15,000 pages. And the full record shows, and I did have a chance to read through it, the full record shows, in fact, nothing ever happened in the so-called peace process, at least the diplomatic phase of aspect of the peace process, because of a fundamental conflict which made impossible any progress. The Palestinians kept saying, we want to start from what they call international legitimacy, meaning international law. The Israelis kept saying, we will not accept that as a starting point. We reject the law. And therefore, even though, as I said, the record runs to something like 15,000 pages, the Palestinians, every two or three months, their negotiators produce what they called a matrix. And the matrix consisted of, on one down the column, the uh, vertical column, consisted of each of the key issues. And the uh, horizontal columns consisted of Israel's position, the Palestinian position. Israel's position, the Palestinian position. The matrix never changed because Israel would not budge on the basic issue, namely, what is the framework that we are going to use to resolve the conflict? And Israel consistently, persistently refused to accept the framework of international law. <coughs> on the other hand, the Palestinians not only accepted the framework, but did everything within their power to accommodate the realities on the ground, but still respect the essence of the law. So to take one example, which is where I'll leave off, 
To take one example, the Palestinians propose, yes, it's true, there are 500,000 settlers on the ground in the West Bank and East Jerusalem now. We recognize that's a political reality that's <coughs> difficult to undo. So they said, we're proposing a map to you. And the map they presented was, we will let you keep 1.9% of the West Bank if you will swap with us 1.9% of Israel. Now, some of you are probably thinking, justly, well, 1.9% doesn't sound like it's going to solve very much. But as it happens, the Palestinians were very conscientious in trying to find a resolution and trying to solve the problem. And they carved out the map such that it would allow that 1.9% would allow 300,000 settlers to remain in place or about 62% of all the settlers to remain in place. It was a very, in my opinion at that rate, it was both a revelation and a very impressive contribution to trying to resolve the conflict realistically, but still maintain the principle of international law. It has to be an even land swap, 1.9% for 1.9%, but it will allow you to keep more than 60% 60 60 of your settlers in place. It was very interesting to read the transcript because they presented the map to the then foreign minister, Sifi Livni. And Livni looked at the map, and you could tell that she recognized, actually, this is reasonable. And she started to put questions to the senior member of that particular negotiating team, Dr. Dr. Sami El Abed. And she would ask him, what about that village? And what about that town? And what about this? And he said, well, we examined it. You could build a bridge over here. You can build a road over here. And he really knew that map. They have, the map consists of many insets, which goes through literally dunam by dunam, every inch of the border between Israel and Palestine. And he showed it. And her response at the end was quite revealing. She said, the, your map is politically impossible for us. No Israeli prime minister can present that map and still retain office. Notice she didn't say it was a physical impossibility. She said the problem was not physical. The problem was political. And that's where we all come in, a resolution is within reach. The whole of humankind, except for those small exceptions, except the US is not a small exception, uh, <laughs> except for those exceptions, they agree on the terms for resolving the conflict. The problem is Israel opposes it, not because it's physically impossible because there's a lack of political will. And the lack of political will, where it springs from, is obvious. Israel has managed to create a situation of probably the first cost-free occupation in human history. All of the military and policing work the work of repressing and suppressing the Palestinians is now done by Palestinians. It's called the Palestinian 
authority. All of the economic burdens of occupation, well, they're all paid for by you. Literally, it's the European governments, including the Dutch government, that pays for all of the projects in the West Bank and Gaza, which sustain the population. There is no economy in Gaza or the West Bank. There is charity, and it's charity not paid for by Israel, a burden of occupation, but paid for by the European governments. Israel periodically goes in, wrecks and destroys, obliterates everything you pay for, and then you dutifully, without any complaint, reinvest and rebuild it. It's a very convenient sort of arrangement. And the political work, of course, is done by the United States at the UN and elsewhere. And so, Israel has no incentive, no incentive to end the occupation, and so there's no political will. And our job, our task, is not to invent <coughs> solutions. Our task is a very simple one, to make the burdens of occupation of, for Israel so great that they outweigh preserving the occupation. And the slogan to me, the simple slogan to reach the public, is perfectly obvious. The slogan is, all we want to do, not more, not less. All we want to do is enforce the law. Now, I'm often accused of being a controversial speaker. So now you, at the end of this evening, have to judge for yourself. Is it really a controversial statement to say that all you want to do is see the law as it's been elucidated by the most representative and the most respected political and legal bodies in the world, you want to see that law enforced. If the law is enforced, there is a solution within reach. And I do believe that we can reach a broad public on, that, on those terms with that slogan. And finally, as Gandhi would put it, finally quicken the dead conscience of the public into life and force your government, my government, all governments to finally do, to finally do what for years and years they've said is the right solution for ending the conflict. To use the language of the civil rights movement in the United States, to get the governments of the world not just to talk the talk in the General Assembly or in the International Court of Justice, but also to get them to walk the walk, to act, to put an end to the injustice, and to put the Israel-Palestine conflict where it belongs after more than a century of suffering and misery, and that is to remove it from the pages of current events and to place it where it finally belongs in the history books. Thank you.